Well, good morning, everybody. We had a couple of awesome outdoor services the last couple of weeks. Hope you had a chance to join us for that. It was pretty cool to be out there. The weather was, weather was great for all of us, one body, to kind of hang out. And felt like I got to catch up on a lot of conversations with people I haven't seen in a while. So that, that was cool. Uh, we're going to be back t- today in John chapter 15 to continue our study through the gospel according to John. So I'd love to pray to get us started this morning. Father, we thank you for today. We do thank you so much for how marvelous your love is for us. Lord, I do pray that we are reminded of that today, the gospel of John, and that uh, these words would sink in, Lord, to, to those that are following you, that maybe just have some questions and some struggles like, like we all do, Lord, to those that have not given their life to you. I pray that this word would speak truth to everybody watching online, everybody in this room, Lord, and that we could be a, a witness for you as we leave this building. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we're going to be in John chapter 15. If you do not have a Bible, we always have Bibles in the, the back, in the lobby. We'd be glad, you can glad to, be glad to take one of those. If you don't own a Bible at all, take that and keep it. We would love to, to give those away. If you know somebody that could use it, take one home for them. We want, we want to give those away. If you're watching online and do not have access to a Bible, you can go to BibleGateway.com to follow through, or you could also send us your address. We'd be glad to send you a Bible as well. So Pastor West started this chapter, uh, I guess it's been three weeks now, in John chapter 15. He went through verse 6. I'm going to pick it up in verse 7, but I want to do a little bit of a recap because it's the, the same story here of Jesus talking about the vine and the branches. And so he is teaching his disciples, and he's just uh, moments before going to the cross. And so there's a lot of red letters here, and it's a lot of Jesus teaching before that time of, of his death. And so he's walking with his disciples, and he talks about him being the vine and them, the followers of Jesus, you and I, believers in Jesus, being the branches. And he says that believers, these branches, need to be pruned. Just like they see the metaphor and the example of the vine, he's saying that believers need that in their life. You and I need to be pruned. That pruning comes in many different forms. It comes through the word. It comes through relationships. It comes through trials. It comes through persecutions. And it is not necessarily a direct result of sin. Sometimes we think that. Sometimes we think, not everything is going right. I must have done something wrong. And Jesus is reminding his disciples, he's reminding us that that is not necessarily true. That the pruning is necessary for what reason? So that you and I would bear fruit. Just like that vine should produce grapes, you and I are to produce fruit in our life. That is why we are being pruned. What types of fruit? Mainly the fruit of the Spirit is kind of where all of that would begin, but that kind of goes out into the rest of our life as to basically everything that we do being glorifying to God, the things that we do in our life. And so how do we bear that fruit? Jesus teaches them that apart from me, apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. And so we try to, as humans, just bear that fruit on our own. I try to be a more loving person, a more kind person, a more faithful person on my own. And Jesus is saying that that's not how it works. You're going to fail. You're going to struggle. You're going to be overwhelmed. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so how do we bear that fruit? How do we do this and fulfill what what Jesus wants from us as disciples? We do that by abiding in him. And so today, through, starting in verse 7, we're going to see what it looks like more, a believer's life that is abiding in him. What does that look like practically, and what should it look like in a believer's life? I have three kids, and so every kid, my two oldest have gone through this stage, and now my younger is in this stage. Everybody that has parents is going to understand this to some degree, but the toddler stage is, it's, it's really fun. I think it is one of the most It's the cutest stage, but it comes with some struggles, right? And so my daughter is now five years old. So this could be any given day, right? She wakes up in the morning. Maybe she got enough sleep. Maybe she didn't. I'm not sure. She comes downstairs and says, hey, mom, dad, can I have have pancakes for breakfast? And we'll say, well, no, today we made eggs. These are your eggs. We would like you to eat the eggs. So she starts off with a little pouting, a little whining. I'm not eating eggs, folding my arms, runs away for a little bit. Maybe several minutes later, she comes back, decides to eat them, decides to throw them on the floor. I'm not sure. (laughs) And then she's asking more questions. So she finishes her breakfast finally and says, can I watch a show? We'd say, you need to finish your chores first. We'd like you to go clean your room. 
So she pouts, she whines, she eventually goes up to her room, gets distracted, all these things are happening, Mass, massive Lego explosion happens, Legos are floating down the hall, bouncing everywhere. She then asks her brothers, she calls them brothers because she has two brothers, hey brothers, one of you, one of you come help me. And so most likely one of them will be like, yeah, no chance am I doing that. And the other one's like, yeah, maybe. So one of them will come over and help. And then they get in the fight and everything's going awful. And then at that point, she is in complete tears and in complete meltdown stage. This is all before 9 a.m., just so you guys know. <laughs> and at that point, she, like, she has nothing left. And so for her, the only place that she is able to find comfort, the only thing that she knows to do at that point is to run to her mother's arms, to run to my wife's arms, and basically jump in there and cry and complain and say, life is awful, all of these things are the worst things ever. But when she is there, when she is sitting there, she starts to calm down a little bit. She starts to wipe away the tears. She even starts to bring a little bit of a smile to her face. And in just a few minutes, she even forgets why she was mad in the first place. And I think of that as the life of a believer because you and I, we walk through this world and in the Christian life, it's like there's so many things that we want to do, we want to be, we want to accomplish. I need to be a better witness. I need to be a more loving neighbor. I need to be a kinder person. I need to show more generosity. And sometimes that, those things can be very overwhelming because we have our daily tasks on top of all of that. And sometimes we feel like just throwing our hands in the air and saying, I, I don't even want to do this. I want to quit. I want to give up. It's way too overwhelming. I can't even do it. And I'm reminded when my daughter does that and when she just rests in her mother's arms and says, this is where I know that I'm loved, is that Jesus is reminding his disciples and reminding us today that you cannot do all of these things on your own. And when you would just sit and abide in my love is when we are reminded how great the Savior is. And we are reminded that his love for us helps us then forget about all those other things and just worry about loving other people and caring about other things. And so today we're going to talk about in this verse 7, the author John uses the word abide 10 times in just 7 verses. Some uh, Pastor West used a few weeks ago, some I'll, I'll talk about today. The author, John, he pens uh, John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation. He uses the word abide a total of 66 times. And so when you see a word that often from one author, you might imagine, like, there's, there's got to be something to this. There has to be something to the word abide. And so what, what does that mean? Why would we care to know what that is? And so to define it, it means to be connected, to be dependent, or have continuance. Many of your versions might use the word remain. And so there is this thought that, that you and I, that we know that everything is going to be okay when we can abide and focus, have constant, continuous, and remain in the Father's love. John is a perfect example. As he writes this, he is called the disciple whom Jesus loved. He walked with him for three years. He was one of his closest companions. And the gospel according to John is the account of Jesus and, and the gospel. But later in his life, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, he is towards the end of his life. And he continues to talk about that, to remain in him and to abide in him. And so John has actually done that and lived that out. So he would know it better than anybody to say, this is what it would be like. It's, it's a life of consistency. It's not just that moment where we break down in tears and, and want to throw our hands up, but those are the moments when we're reminded. It's that constant, continual remaining in him. And so we're going to pick it up here in verse 7 of John chapter 15. It says this, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is one of those verses that we need to be careful with, because... Context is massive in the Bible. When we are studying scripture, it is very important to understand the context. You can take that very deep to knowing the author, knowing the setting, knowing the background, going into that. That stuff is good to study. But I would say at least when you are studying scripture, make sure in context you know what is being said in the paragraph. The sentences before that, the sentences after that, and then of course, consistency with scripture as well. So I could take the Bible and I could say to you, John says, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you and stop there. And in 
Partially, that is true, that I would be telling you the truth that the Bible does say that. But that is not what the Bible is saying in context. And so we must be careful to not take that out of context and use things the way that we want them to be used. I want to show you a couple of verses that would help illustrate this point. Matthew chapter 7, if you have your Bibles, flip back to Matthew. First book in the New Testament. Gospel according to Matthew, another one of Jesus' disciples. In verse, chapter 7, verse 7 says this. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who, re- who asks receives. To the one who seeks will find. And the one who knocks will be opened. Which one of you, who, who his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those that ask him? I want to first start by making known that we have a God who genuinely wants good things for us. Sometimes we can forget that. Sometimes we can focus on the other things or the things that are not necessarily true. And we might think we have this, there's this distant God who's millions of miles away. He has no idea or no care for what is happening for me and my family. And that is not true. That is far from the truth. And so we need to first be reminded that we do have a God who cares for us and genuinely wants good things for our life. As a father, myself, my, my wife and I, we try to teach our kids, we try to raise them in a way that we can have some open communication. I want to know all about them. I know little things about them, but the older they get, we want them to share their dreams with us. We want to share their thoughts with us, share their struggles with us, even on a, on a daily basis. Things that you want to do, things that you want to study, things that you hate, that you don't want to do, that you feel like we're forcing you to do. We want to we have those conversations and talk about that because genuinely, we, we want the best for our kids. But I also know that God has created them in such a way that we want to find their gifts and their abilities that would fit for what God has called for them to do. But it's important to remember first that we do serve a God who does care about us and loves us and genuinely wants good things for us. Flip back to the gospel according to John, John chapter 14, just one chapter before where we're at today in verse 13 says this, whatever you ask in my name, this will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And so this goes along with this and saying that God the Father wants us to ask. But the important thing is, is that he knows, like, like parents for their children, we genuinely know what is best for our kids. As parents on earth, we make mistakes. So it's not, a, not the perfect example, as Matthew says here, but it, is, but it is with God. And so he knows genuinely what is best for us. And so he says, you ask that the Father may be glorified in his will and in Jesus' name. Now we can ask, people ask, I would love a Ferrari. In the name of Jesus, amen. And that's sometimes what we say. That's not the point. That's not what it means by in Jesus' name. It doesn't mean that you can just close out every prayer and say that. It means according to the will and the things that Jesus would have and want for us. Why? Because the Father knows best. Because the Lord knows best. He knows us better than we even know ourselves. And he genuinely knows what is good for us. So he's saying pray according to the Father's will. And let's bring it back to John 15, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. If we are abiding in him, if we are giving everything that we have to him and surrendering our lives to him and saying, I'm just going to remain and continue in your will, then we genuinely do want those things that the Lord would have for us. We, would, we are praying for his will and we genuinely want his will. That is what this is referring to here. So make, make sure we are careful with how we interpret this. And this would be according to his will, knowing that the Father understands us more than we even understand ourselves. All right, let's continue on this. Verse 8 says this, "By, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Every single believer in Jesus, if you are a genuine, true believer, would say, I want my life to glorify him. 
That does not mean that we don't make mistakes. That doesn't mean that we misunderstand some things at times. But at the heart of who we are as a believer, we would all agree, man, I do. I hope at the end of all of this, my life was in some way glorifying to God. That's, that's what I want to do with my life. That's why I want to be here. And he says that comes when the fruit is, is, is being shown. But here's the, here's the thing that we have to understand is that fruit is the proof, and it says this in this verse, the fruit is the proof that we are abiding in him. It is not that thing that, again, that we muster up and try to do on our own and to work for these things. It is proof that we have already given our life to God, that I am resting in him, that I believe and trust in, that his will is greater than mine, and I give him my life. That's when the Father is glorified. That's when those things happen. This is a hard concept for us to understand because the world that we live in teaches the merit system, right? I want a job. And so job A, I'm going to go try to get. What do I need to do? I got to go to school. I got to get some form of training. I got to study. I got to prepare. I got to go get interviews for that job. And hopefully I have all of the qualifications that they're asking for. When I get that job, I have to continue to show up. I have to be a good employee. I have to continue to work my way and maybe even work up the corporate ladder in that sense. And this is not, I'm not saying that this is sin in any way, but I'm saying that is the world that we live in. You know, we teach our kids, like, you're not just going to be handed everything. You need to be able to work for things to understand that. That is true in this world. What's beautiful about Christianity, what's beautiful about Jesus Christ is that he is the opposite of that. He says, I love you in your state of who you are. There is nothing that you can do to earn my love. I already love you. And then when we understand that, his unconditional love comes out in, in us to other people because we understand that the Father loved us so much. And so that's, what it, that's what's so cool about Christianity that we see that because of how much his unconditional love becomes a reflection in our life. Verse 9 is going to continue this thought. It says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. First John 4, 19 says that we love because he first loved us. So this means that you and I have the capacity, the ability to love because God first loved. Because God created us in his image, and he gave us his son, and it says that abide in him, and then my love will come through you. Because God first loved us. So how awesome is it for us to understand his unconditional love? You and I do not have to wake up every day and say, like we do with our job, I, how, do I, how do I please my boss today? How do I get ahead in work? How do I get ahead in life? We don't have to say every day, how do I earn my father's love today? We don't have to do that. That is already given to us. But sometimes you and I forget that because that's just not the way the, way the world works. And so we have to see that. We have to see proof, and we have to continue to, to work at it. But we need to know that we are loved beyond anything we could ever imagine from the Father. And there's nothing that we have to do to earn that. Romans chapter 8. If you have a Bible, you can flip there. Romans chapter 8, verse 38. It says, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so we think every day, man, I've had, I've had a good day. I feel like I've done well. I think I loved well today. Jesus must love me today. But tomorrow's a different day. Tomorrow's, a, you know, tomorrow's going to be a struggle, and I got to do this, and I don't want to do this. And then we're up and down with even thinking, does, does Jesus even love me? And he reminds us, he's reminding his disciples before he leaves that it, it is greater than anything we can ever imagine. And he loves us no matter what, and we don't have to earn that. Within a, a marriage, there is, um, you guys have probably heard of the five love languages. It's, it's a really good book. It's a great concept to understand within really any relationship. I would recommend any married couple read that and understand that. But it teaches that every one of us have a love language that we receive. And so when we receive that specific love language, we'll call it quality of time is one of them. When we receive that, we genuinely feel loved. And it would be natural for us, if our spouse gives us that quality time, 
for me to naturally want to love her back. The opposite of that is true, where if we do not receive that, we don't feel that quality love, there begins a sense of wanting to separate and a sense of I'm not quite feeling loved and so I just kind of want to back away. And so the, the cool thing about Jesus is, is that he's not like that. He is unconditionally loving us. And he is speaking our love language, is telling us that I, that I love you more than anything that you can ever even imagine. But we just have to be reminded of that. And John says this here in verse 15, in chapter 15. Verse 10. Verse 10 says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So what does love and obedience have to do with any of this? How does this go together? I love that he, he, he brings it here in context because if the first verse just said, love me and keep my commandments, there might be some confusion because it would just be like, well, why, why would I want to keep your commandments? I don't really know anything about you. He's already explained the reason and the abiding and the love and how much our father, how much Jesus cares for us. And so that those that are saying, yes, I'm, I'm understanding of this, I'm all in, I give you my life, then he's saying, now I would like you to obey my commandments, follow these things. Why? Because there is a level of trust of knowing that when I know, when I have abided in him and understand him, remain in him, I know that whatever my father has for me is way better than anything I could ever do. And so I trust in him, genuinely trust in him. If you tell me to do something, that sounds like anything better than I can come up with. I've tried things on my own, they're not working. And so I do genuinely want to obey those things. And so that is how love and obedience is connected. My wife and I have rules with our kids. We have a lot of freedoms, but they do come with parameters. The reason that we have those parameters is because we have something that we're striving for, a vision that we're striving for with what we want our kids to do and achieve and to be, to be used by God. Is it perfect? Of course not. But it is something that we are going after. And so we make, um, we give them freedom, but we have these parameters. So this is an exaggerated version, but I would say to them, sunny, sunny afternoon, go outside, play in the yard. Can we do this? Can we do that? You know what? You can do, you can do anything you want. You can play in the driveway. You can play basketball. You can turn the water hose on. You can hit the golf clubs in the lawn. You can jump on the trampoline. Go tear it up. Go tear holes out there. I don't care. As long as you don't do jumping jacks in front of oncoming traffic, right? And the reason would be because we want to keep them around for another day or two. And I have a reason to say, please don't do that. The younger they are, they might not, I know that's an exaggerated version, but the, the younger they are, they might not understand the reasons for that. When they, are, when they become older and they have learned more and more to have these conversations, they're living with us, they're abiding with us, they see our reason for it, it comes to an age where they say, I totally get it. I totally get it. You're letting us do all these things, but you're saying no for our protection in this certain point. And I trust you. So that when we ask them to do something else, they're willing to trust because they understand that. That comes with a, a maturing and a life of remaining and abiding. That doesn't come from one day not knowing who our Lord is. And so in 1 John 5, 3, it says that his commands are not burdensome. That does not mean that we don't ever struggle or we don't have temptations or we don't have to sometimes fight through them. But it does mean that at the end of the day, I'm willing to do them because I realize I have complete trust in who my God is. And I know that he has greater things out there for me than I could ever imagine. Yes. So you take a verse like, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so maybe one, some of us in here would say, well, why, why would he give that verse? That's annoying. I want to party. I want to be able to drink. I want to do these things. And those that have had a, a mature life and been in Christ would say, I realize, I've, I see the danger in what that would do. And he is only telling me that for my protection. He's only telling me that genuinely for my good. And so we need to be reminded that when God has these commandments for us, they are not burdensome. Why? Because with all 100% honesty, he is genuinely looking out for our best interest, even though we cannot fully grasp that. And in verse 11 says this, 
It says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. For me, when I'm reading things, I always like to ask why or what's the point? Not because I'm trying to be rebellious in any way. I'm just not that smart. And so I just want to know what is the point of this? I just want to understand. And so in this, I, would, I could see myself walking with Jesus and say, why? why would you say all these things? Why would you tell me this? And he says to them, I I want you to know all these things so that my joy would be in you, so that you could be full of joy. And again, another thing that's saying, I want great things for you. I am not trying to make you miserable. There's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is circumstantial. Joy is way deeper than that. I am happy when it is 80 degrees and sunny outside. I love warm weather. I want to go outside and hang out. I am not happy when it's 20 degrees and snowing. But when it is 20 degrees and snowing, I can have joy because I can say, you know what? At the end of the day, the weather doesn't matter. I have something greater than that. I have something deeper than that. And that's knowing that Jesus loves me and he has given my life for me. And at the end of it all, the worst thing that can happen to me, literally the worst thing that can happen is that I, that I die. And I get to be with him eternally. And so that is what joy would be for somebody who can understand that, understand the greater picture. And so if you are not abiding in Jesus, then those those circumstances that make us happy up and down will destroy our life because we have not been abiding in him. We have not remained in him and I am not full of joy. And so I let whatever, whatever the calendar dictates today, whatever's going to happen today, that's going to be my roller coaster of life and I have nothing to fall back on. And that's what Jesus is saying to his disciples. That is what he's saying to us, is that we can be full of joy. I know life is tough. I know life can be overwhelming. I know life can be very hard. I hope today, I hope this passage is a reminder of how we can not be overwhelmed by giving all of that to Jesus. In about four chapters here, chapter 14 through 17, If you have a red letter edition Bible, you can just flip really quickly and see how much red writing is in here. This is Jesus giving instructions to his disciples before he goes to the cross. And I just want to highlight a few things, a few of his promises that he gives to them and he gives to us before he goes to the cross to remind them of how much we are loved. He says, I am going to prepare a place for you that I will be with you there. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am sending the Holy Spirit, a comforter for you. I give you peace, peace that is greater than anything that this world can offer. You are more loved than you can ever imagine, as much as the Father has love for his Son. I want you to know that you can have my joy, and your joy can be full. I have overcome the world. All these anxieties and struggles and frustrations of the world, I have overcome all of that. And then in chapter 17, he goes, Jesus himself goes to the Father on our behalf and prays before he goes to the cross. And this is something that we have to see in scripture to be reminded of how much Jesus genuinely loves us. And so for the believer here today, if you are somebody who said, I've given my life to Jesus, I know that. I wanna remind you of a few things today. First John three, verse one says this. See what kind of love the father has given to us that we should be called children of God. He loves us so much that he calls us children. He calls us heirs to the throne. He sees us as righteous. All of our wickedness that we see in and of ourselves, he looks down and says, I see the blood of Jesus, and you are a child of God, and you are righteous. And you get to celebrate that with me eternally. And all I'm asking for you to do is just remain in me. Just abide in me. Just stay with me through this storm. So what does that look like? Every person is going to be a little bit different on how they define what it would mean to abide. But you guys know, anybody that's a believer in Christ, you know when you're disconnected from the Lord. You know when you're disconnected and you're, and you're quenching the Holy Spirit and you're like, nah, I'd rather not do that. I'd rather not pray. I'm not even interested in hearing what you have to say right now. And you know what happens when you feel a deeper connection with the Lord. And I would say some common denominators would be communication which includes prayer, which includes reading of the word, which includes listening to sermons, and then some form of worship. For every one of us, that may look a little bit different on on how we respond to that. 
But if you're a believer in Jesus, this is, this is our reminder to continue to abide in him. What does that look like for you? For a non-believer, for somebody who does not know Jesus, I'm glad you're listening, I'm glad you're watching online. Maybe you think, I don't even know of a God of love. I think of all these questions and why is the world so ugly and there's just no way that I could even be loved. I'm not even deserving of his love. Why would he do that for me? I don't see any love of Jesus that you're talking about. Romans 5, 8 says God demonstrates his love for us, for you, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so that means you're right. You, you cannot earn his love, but he gives it anyway. He gives it anyway, even in our state. And he says, I do love you. And all I'm asking is for a response to, to reach out your hand. 1 John 4, verse 9 says this, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so I would tell you, I'm glad you're asking questions. I'm glad you're listening. I'm glad you're here if you do not know Jesus. But I want to remind you that you do have a God out there who genuinely loves you and wants the best for you. And so sometimes you might hear some of the lies of the world that he doesn't love you. And this is, this is the proof that he does, that he sent Jesus, who was the only one who could pay that penalty for us and to give us that life eternal. And all you need to do is say, yes, Lord, I accept. I give my life to you. Father, we come to you. We thank you for today. For those that are in Christ, Lord, we say thank you for your love. What a reminder today is. I pray that we would continue to abide in that, to remain in that. I pray that you would each help us to understand specifically what that means for our life. Lord, for the ones that are still asking, have not given their life to you, they don't see any love of, of God. Lord, I pray that they would see that today. I pray that they would ask. I pray that you would show them that. Lord, and I pray that believers in here that are abiding in you would be a picture of that love as well. And we would welcome that. And we would have conversations. And we thank you, Jesus, for who you are. I pray that you would do a work in lives this week. That we would honor you as we leave this building. We pray it in the name of Jesus. 